Given the importance of Darth Vader to the Star Wars saga, it's no surprise that he was always involved in the script in some way from the very beginning. But it might surprise you to learn just how much the character developed before he first appeared on our screens. In 1973, four years before the release of A New Hope, George Lucas put his ideas for what would eventually become Star Wars down in a two-page synopsis titled Journal of the Wills. The Journal of the Wills was expanded into a 14-page story treatment titled The Star Wars, which introduced the character of General Vader, an Imperial commander. In 1974, Lucas converted these ideas into a rough draft screenplay. By the time of this first script, General Vader had become Darth Vader, a character described as a tall, grim-looking general. Interestingly, this draft also included another character called Anakin Starkiller, the eventual inspiration behind the character's birth name. But these weren't the only characters in the first rough draft of Star Wars that resembled Darth Vader as we know him today. The script also included a number of Knights of the Sith, led by the evil Dark Lord Prince Valorum. It also describes a character named Kane Starkiller, a cyborg who is half machine, half man. By the second draft of Star Wars, Vader was becoming much more fleshed out. He was now described as a seven-foot Sith Knight with flowing black robes, engaging in a duel with Deke Starkiller, a character who would eventually evolve into Luke Skywalker. Despite his imposing stature and ability to mow down rebel scum with ease, Vader was originally intended to die in the film. With George Lucas yet to file his final draft, the plan was at one time to kill Vader off during the now famous trench run scene towards the film's climax. Thankfully for us, Later Star Wars drafts involved the scene in which Vader escaped the Death Star's deadly explosion. Although Darth Vader had by Lucas's final draft become far more like the Sith Lord we know and love today, his physical design wasn't yet finalised. Originally Lucas was going to go with a look similar to that of Emperor Palpatine and Darth Maul, with a simple hood and dark robes, but that was about to change. Enter Ralph McQuarrie. The veteran film designer was brought in at the beginning of 1975 to paint five moments from Lucas's script in hopes to convince Fox to invest. Macquarie based Vader's appearance on the iconic warriors of feudal Japan, designing a samurai-inspired helmet for the character's spacesuit. The mask was only intended for Vader's scenes in outer space, but Lucas loved the design so much that it became a permanent fixture of the character. With the completed concept art and a budget of $1,173 for just the costume, it was up to John Mollo the costume designer for the original trilogy, to translate Macquarie's sketches into a usable costume. Without straying too far from Macquarie's sketches, Molo, inspired by both samurai and Nazi influences, fine-tuned the design. The job of sculpting much of the armour fell to sculptor Brian Muir, and by 1976, Darth Vader's iconic suit was born. With Fox now on board and development well underway, the question of who to cast as the gigantic villain quickly arose. With London chosen as the film's production base, Englishman David Prowse was drafted in to portray the mysterious Dark Lord. Prowse was already well known in Britain as the Green Cross Code Man, a superhero invented to promote road safety for kids. He had also starred in A Clockwork Orange in 1972, which caught the attention of George Lucas. The 6'6 six six bodybuilder was offered the chance to play either Chewbacca or Darth Vader. Believing that villains are more memorable, Prowse chose to play Darth Vader, but what he didn't realise was that his face would be hidden for the role. Prowse also believed his voice would be used, but he soon discovered at a screening of the film that all of the lines he had recorded had been re-recorded by American stage actor James Earl Jones. Co-star Carrie Fisher had nicknamed Prowse Darth Farmer on set for his distinctive West Country accent, a voice George Lucas believed audiences wouldn't find intimidating enough. Was there any of the royal family on board? Who were you carrying? <sighs> this misunderstanding was the beginning of an uneasy relationship between Prowse and Lucasfilm, one which continues to this day. James Earl Jones may have provided the voice for Darth Vader, but he wasn't behind the character's iconic deep breathing. It's thanks to now legendary sound engineer Ben Burt that audiences were blessed with Vader's famous breathing an unsettling sound which intensified the character's terrifying presence. Burt created the sound by recording himself breathing through a scuba diving respirator. With the breaths added to the final cut of the film, Darth Vader as we know him today was now firmly a reality. 
With just the one suit made for Darth Vader in A New Hope, it was decided that a new, more stylish and comfortable suit would be produced for the sequel. The chess box now had working lights, different coloured buttons and Orobesh letters. The belt received upgraded boxes, switches and lights, but the biggest changes were to the helmet. The dome at the top was fixed more securely, and the triangular chin vent was made larger to improve the vision and breathing for David Prowse. In A New Hope, Vader only appeared for a grand total of 12 minutes, but after the overwhelming success both of A New Hope and the character himself, it was decided early on that The Empire Strikes Back would centre around Darth Vader's relationship with Luke Skywalker. What this relationship would be wasn't clear at first, and in The Empire Strikes Back's first draft, the now iconic scene in which Darth Vader reveals himself to be Luke's father was absent. When George Lucas first dreamt the saga up, Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker were conceived as totally different characters. Given that he was originally written to die in the first film, Darth Vader was set to have a short life in the galaxy far, far away before the decision was made to keep him around. With the help of co-writer Lawrence Kasdan, the decision was made to retcon Lucas's original plan for Anakin Skywalker and to combine the characters as one, leading to arguably the most iconic line in cinema history. I am your father. Michael Kaminsky argues in his book The Secret History of Star Wars that Darth Vader's role as Luke's father wasn't even considered prior to 1978, and that The Empire Strikes Back was well on its way to having Anakin Skywalker as a separate character before the changes were made. The decision itself was kept top secret. When filming the reveal, David Prowse was instructed to say the line, No, Obi-Wan was your father, to keep the secret safe. Mark Hamill himself only learned of the twist minutes before the scene was shot. The Empire Strikes Back also saw a third name added to the list of actors to play the character, with stuntman Bob Anderson stepping into the iconic suit for the fight scenes both in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Anderson was much smaller than Prowse, a problem which was resolved using small stilts and low angle shots. With Darth Vader now cemented in the public imagination, it was up to all involved in the making of Return of the Jedi to bring a fitting end to the character's story. It was decided by Kasdan and Lucas that Vader would redeem himself by saving his son from the clutches of the evil Emperor Palpatine. The only problem was that at some point, he would have to be unmasked to bring a human face to the tragedy. Since Anakin Skywalker's death was unquestionably the emotional climax of the film, the casting crew sought stage actor Sebastian Shaw in the role. When Shaw arrived at the set for filming, he ran into his friend Ian McDermott, the actor playing the Emperor. When McDermott asked him what he was doing there, Shaw responded, I don't know dear boy, I think it's something to do with science fiction. Shaw's presence during filming was kept secret from all but the minimum cast and crew, and he was contractually obliged to keep quiet. The unmasking scene, directed by Richard Marquand, was filmed in one day and required only a few takes, with no alteration from the original dialogue. Lucas personally directed Shaw for his appearance in the final scene of the film. Shaw stood in front of a black velvet screen and was told to look happy and smile. For 22 years, this would be the last anyone would see of Darth Vader on the big screen. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and fans were eagerly anticipating the long-talked-about scene involving Anakin and Obi-Wan fighting above a molten volcano. Hayden Christensen's body shape was used as the basis for moulds of the new Darth Vader suit. On September 1st, 2003, 20 years after Return of the Jedi, the day came for Darth Vader's return. With a specially designed burnt Anakin suit and prosthetic makeup to recreate the same scars worn by Sebastian Shaw, filming began for the final scenes before Hayden Christensen would don Darth Vader's suit. The release of Rogue One in 2016 saw the character return in triumphant form, slaughtering rebel scum just prior to the events of A New Hope. Two new actors were drafted in to play Vader in Spencer Wilding and Daniel Naprus, while Vader's armour from A New Hope was recreated in painstaking detail. For the scene at Darth Vader's castle, a location which featured in The Empire Strikes Back's first draft, the writers decided to set the fortress on Mustafar, where Vader sustained his grievous injuries in Revenge of the Sith. Doug Chang, the production designer who used Ralph McQuarrie's sketches from decades previously to design the castle, explained that Mustafar was chosen due to the special meaning it has for the character. As for Rogue One's climatic scene, in which Darth Vader slaughters a number of rebels retreating to the Tantive IV, it almost never happened. 
as director Gareth Edwards explained. We were cutting the film together and my editor, Jabez Olsen, he said, I think you need to see one last moment with Darth Vader. Like, I think he needs to have like uh, a badass moment. And we all felt the same way. When he mentioned this, it was about four months maybe from, from release. And so we thought, oh, maybe we've missed the opportunity to do this. And Kathy Kennedy came in and uh, Jabez pitched this idea to her and she really loved it. The resulting scene instantly drew praise from across the board for depicting Vader at his ruthless, formidable best. 